Welcome to West Valley College's seventh annual F Word Global Gender Symposium. We have five outstanding presenters today. And in the spirit of maintaining a truly student-led student conference, we have a moderator today, former uh, presenter at the Global Gender Symposium last year, the outstanding and exceptional Susan Lamasny, who's going to take us through. Hello everyone, thank you so much for coming today. My name is Susan Lomazny. I wanted to start off by pitching everyone, please take at least one of the Women Gender Study Queer classes or the Social Justice class. We have two, uh, we have an ADT and an AA degree for both of those classes and it will really help expose you to a ton of great new intersectional information where we can all see the world a little more queerly. Um, today, I hope that you expose yourself to new information and find a space to grow. And before we begin, I would like to thank Lee Burrell for celebrating, for creating this event and inspiring us to be better intersectional feminists every day. She gave me and many others um, a space for me to grow myself, find myself, and reclaim myself. Um, now, please make sure your cell phones are silenced, but not your activism. And please give your full attention to Kelly Yu. Kelly Yu is a middle college student um, in her first year here at West Valley, and she is looking to pursue a major in dance. Today, she is presenting Carl Walker, a commentary on race. So, Kara Walker is a contemporary artist, activist, and filmmaker and her work mainly focuses on issues regarding race, gender, and sexuality. So she was born in Stockton, California, so pretty close to here, and she was raised by her mother and father, Larry, who was actually the chair of the art department at the University of the Pacific. So throughout her entire life, she was really just surrounded by art, and she grew up with it in her house, so it was just always something that she was used to. And um, um, Midway through her father's career, he was invited to be a professor at the University of Georgia. So her family actually moved out to Georgia, and at the time there, there was a lot of racism, not just the amount that we see today, but it was pretty close to the time when Jim Crow laws had just been abolished. So it was a lot of very, very apparent violent racism. And for this reason, Kara Walker was actually very uncomfortable talking about race and gender, which is interesting to me because I love seeing her character development throughout her life, going from a place of being so uncomfortable with talking about this to just basing her art around it, basing her entire life and her entire career around it. So these silhouette pieces are some of her most well-known pieces. They look like cartoons upon first glance, but if you look closer at them, they actually depict scenes of very graphic sexual violence. And part of the reason that she wanted these to look like cartoons is because when you first look at them, you don't really think much of them. But then when you look closer, you start to realize all the awful things that are happening, and that's kind of a reflection of our own world. Like, we see so many things, but a lot of these things aren't processed properly until we kind of step closer and really, really look at what's happening. So this is just a close-up of one of her pieces. It's a little girl, and she's reaching toward a skull, but in the piece, nobody's actually handing her the skull. So it's almost like she's kind of imagining this skull for herself and in a lot of art skulls and skeletons will reflect death but I thought that this wasn't wasn't really a physical death but more of a cultural or spiritual death stemming from her time in Georgia with her culture being pushed down and just like eradicated so this is just another one of her pieces this is displayed in a museum and there's two doors so this photo is taken from one of the doorways and then you can see the other one there so from this, you can tell that her artwork really surrounds you, but not in a way where it really slaps you in the face, but in a way where it just forces you to be in it. Like, because we are, we are surrounded by all of these injustices, and that's what she wanted to reflect in her work. So this is the piece with the little girl in the skull. She's down in the right corner. And this is a quote from a book that we read in my class, and it says, Drawing from sources ranging from slave testimonials to historical novels, Carol Walker's work features brutal stereotypes in a host of situations that are frequently violent and sexual in nature. So this isn't a quote from her, this is a quote from someone in the book who was observing her work. But I think that this silhouette right here is a perfect example of that because everything that you look at, some of the things just look like, 
a woman holding a baby or just people playing. But if you look closer here, there's somebody with horns like chasing a little kid. And then there's more, here's more of her silhouette work. This is really interesting because she incorporates color into these and I think that's really powerful because in all of her other works, she's kind of encouraging the person walking into the exhibit to see what they see and to kind of interpret it in their own way. But this, really the colors kind of create shadows which creates a more like daunting effect. So it kind of shows more of what she wanted you to see in the artwork. And then this is something totally different. This is one of her um, sugar sculptures. So this, this one actually, there's a lot of different versions of it. I was watching an interview with her and she's sitting there describing her work and she has a ton of these little sculptures all surrounding her and they all look exactly like this. And I think the part that's most beautiful about this is very obviously she's just accepting the human body and just accepting women, but this, Sculpture wasn't really made for a specific reason. She just walked into this warehouse. It was covered in molasses. It was like an old sugar factory. And she just thought like, you know, this is the perfect place to just build a huge sugar sculpture. So then in my class, this was the discussion question that I used. Are Kara Walker's silhouette pieces offensive? And how do they make us acknowledge the injustices that she sees in the world? So I'm mainly gonna focus on the second question now because in our class, we had a lot of different answers to the first one. But I really think that they make us acknowledge the injustices that she sees because it make, her art makes us think. It makes us think, why do we first see these images as just cartoons, as just things that are seemingly like everyday life, but then once you look closer, it's just, they're all violent and awful. So then I wanted to include a video in here. And this is from the San Francisco Museum of Modern Art. It's an interview that they did with her. I guess all of the pieces in some way, the large installations are um, sort of disparate narratives or scenes or interactions that maybe are drawn on, uh, you know, very sort of base, you know, 19th century stereotypes of black characters, pickaninnies or whatever, and then characters that are sort of loosely designed around that, but then are, are you know clearly my own identity, my own hand, or another sort of sort of trope. But they've all been you know reduced to this this one thing, this black paper. My thinking, you know, is, you know if a if a person like me can you know find themselves making you know picking any Negro you know minstrel art, meaning for it to be ironic. <laughs> um, there's still this kind of, you know, backhanded cycle at play, you know, that, that sort of undoes even my most uh, sort of progressive ambitions, which is that it can still kind of fall back into, into uh, familiar terrain. My heart and, and my art was, was filled with a fair amount of, of sort of received violence, received, you know, some of it real and some of it sort of, um, um, exaggerated. The interesting thing for me um, in my work is how um, well, how easy it is actually to how easy it is to commit atrocities. I mean that's actually kind of what what the work is about. It's just like if a girl like me can think this stuff then what? So I you know I have an uneasy relationship with my own imagination at the same time, I'd rather make the work than hold it all inside and get, and get uh, strange. So I really liked this video because I saw, I saw a lot of the things that she said within myself and I just thought that was really interesting that she was kind of examining the human mind and that's why I wanted to bring it to all of you because it's just, it's so thought provoking. Like it really makes you think, like I love the way that she said, if I'm thinking all of this, then what? And it kind of leaves you, leaves you to create your own interpretation, just like all of her art. Are there any questions? We'll do the Q and A at the end. Oh, okay. Thank you so much. Thank you. Now, feminism creates powerful movements, from what we've seen here in America with the hashtag #MeToo movement um, to Wangari Maathai's uh, echo feminism in Africa. And each movement brings people together and strengthens societies. 
Uh, but even with all that progress, there is still a lot of work to be done. Next up, we have Ellie Hudson. She is the founder of the Democrats of West Valley Club and the president. She is a political science major and has been accepted into UC Berkeley and UC Santa Cruz. Today, she is presenting Dismantling Rape Culture, What the U.S. Could Learn from Nordic Countries. Okay. All right. Uh, hi, everyone. My name is Ellie Hudson. And today, I will be offering my presentation, Dismantling Rape Culture, What the United States Could Learn from Progressive Nordic Countries. And before I begin, I want to just give a brief trigger warning because this presentation uh, could potentially contain uh, potentially stressful um, triggers regarding sexual assault and rape. So I just look in this t into this topic because of the seemingly uh, recent disregard for women and sexual assault against women and the uh, seemingly en endless cases of sexual assault that received little to no consequences and things like the Me Too movement and Time's Up movement also inspired me to, as they like acted against powerful uh, uh, aggravators. So surely it was better, it's better elsewhere and I wanted to look into who we could model our, our system after. Um, so before I begin, I just wanna get a brief survey from the audience. Just raise your hand if you know what rape culture is. Okay, that's good, a lot of you do know. So just, uh, for a brief overview, rape, rape culture is a society or environment whose prevailing social attitudes have the effect of normalizing or trivializing sexual assault and abuse. So, okay, cool. So the top three, uh, the topics, the top three topics that I boiled down my research to, where uh, for the contributive factors for rape culture were sexual education, including actual sex and consent education punishments for sexual assault, and respect for women that is translated through elected officials who are females. So these are my three research questions that guided my research. All right. Yeah, sure, definitely. Um, so the first question is, how does teaching comprehensive sexual education and consent differ between these countries, and what correlations can be made in populations as a result of their given sexual education? And the second is, how do the punishments vary for sexual assault crimes between these countries? Do the punishments deter offenders from committing sexual assault? And as women gain influence in these countries, does the rate of sexual violence change? Does the amount of female political or government leaders a country has lead to substantially more women running for office? So, so just so we can get a, uh, an idea of where we're talking, that's the United States, obviously, and the five Nordic con countries that I'm talking about are Iceland, Norway, Sweden, Finland, and Denmark. So, and this is just a little helpful pyramid that shows you how rape culture is constructed in our society. So on the bottom tier, it's normalization, and at the top, it's explicit violence. And then in between that, it goes to degradation and then on to removal of autonomy. So on the bottom, it, uh, it includes rape jokes, victim blaming, sexism, like unequal pay and things like that. And then it goes to stalking, following, catcalling, whistling, then on to sexual coercion, threatening, groping, things like that na of that nature. And then at the top, it's explicit rape, murder, and violence. So this is just, just to show you that they're not isolated incidents and that each one reinforces those above it. So, um, and rape culture d uh, can and does affect men, but in America, it's explicitly weaponized against women. So I just wanted to mention that. Okay, so here's a table that, uh, shows per country the rapes per 100,000 people. So you can see that in the United States, it's substantially larger than in the Nordic countries. And I just wanted to also point out that these are only rapes that have been reported because most are not reported. So yeah, Iceland's rocking it on the bottom. There we go. So sexual education and consent in the United States. So only 24 states in the District of Columbia actually require sex education. And the education among those states vary. Uh, but according to the 2014 uh, CDC school health profiles, fewer than half of high schools and only one-fifth of, mid of middle schools teach all 16 topics rec recommended as essential components, which include critical communication and decision-making skills. 
And then 66% of sexually active teens wish they had waited longer to have sex for the first time. And a recent Georgetown University study shows that uh, starting sex ed in primary schools uh, helps to build the foundation of mutual responsibility and respect, which is essential to sexual health. And then the last point states that only eight of our states required their sex, edu sex ed curriculum to mention consent. And at the same time, in 2015, funding for abstinence-only education increased uh, to $75 million a year. So these are the states that were, uh, technically require uh, consent in their sex education. But again, it, in the states, it varies. And then within the counties and cities, it varies because I've lived in California my whole, my whole life, and I didn't en encounter consent education until college. And at that point, I think that's a little too late. So, so then sex education and consent in the Nordic countries. So as you can see, uh, sex ed in Nordic countries begins earlier, and it's more reinforced in longer classes, and it includes more diverse fields, like uh, consent and ethics in Norway, and uh, consent and harassment in Finland. And in many of them, it's required by law. Um, and it includes uh, assertiveness in Denmark, and really importantly, it, inclu it includes various different sexualities, like in Iceland. So in the Nordic countries, kids are introduced to sex education at younger ages, and it's not unco uncommon that they would start right in kindergarten. Uh, they learn more consistently and about diverse topics so that they are well prepared, and um, consent and respect is seen as a necessity to these curriculums that are required by law. Okay, so now we're going to talk about the legality for sexual assault in the Nordic countries. So again, in the Nordic countries, um, they're kind of more advanced in this aspect than we are. So let's just look at them. So in Sweden, um, they've advanced it so that victims only need to prove a lack of explicitly stated consent in order to prosecute the offender. Um, and then in Denmark, prison sentences for rapes and sexual assaults have been extended, and that's a common theme throughout all of them. Um, and in, in Norway, they're actually taking action plans that aid victims of sexual assault and rape to rehabilitate them and help them heal after the crime. And uh, Finland, actually, has broadened the definition of rape in the criminal code of Finland. So acts previously treated as coercion into a sexual act are now treated as rapes that carry the penalty of four years imprisonment. So they don't take these crimes lightly as they should not be. Um, so. so Nordic countries generally react quickly to demands for, social ju uh, for justice against sexual violence when with legislation, whereas the United States is rather stagnant, if not backtracking, in terms of um, prosecuting those who commit sexual assault. So, and it's a little bit harder to pinpoint in the United States since it varies state by state, but uh, basically, um, after the whole process is said and done, it ultimately goes to the judge to um, determine the sentence. So as you can see in California, it, a sexual assault conviction holds a possible sentence of 24, 36, or 48 months in prison, as well as $10,000 fine. That's a determinant sentence, ultimately, ultimately um, determined by the judge. So it's kind of um, too subjective for it to be seriously prosecuted. So when America was demanding, has recently demanded for so, uh, justice against sexual violence, this, our current Secretary of Education, Betsy DeVos, actually weakened Title IX, which protected sexual assault victims on college campuses. So it made it actually harder to convict those accused of sexual assault. And only formal complaints can now be investigated. Only events on campus can now be investigated. Um, it's easier to accuse the victim of sex discrimination, and it allows cross-examination of the victim and the accused, which is extremely traumatic for the victim, and even will cause them to not report the crime to begin with. Um, and I just wanted to point out a case, like there's been way more recent cases, but I know one that you guys probably all have heard about, heard about is the Brock Turner case, where the judge only gave him six months in prison and, you know, we carried out justice against Aaron Persky and recalled him, which I think was a, which I think was democracy, because he miscarried justice. And moving on. 
OK, so this is a bar graph of gender balance or imbalance in national legislatures. So the blue is men and the red is women. So in Nordic countries, there are far more women in the national legislatures than the United States over on that side. So it's a rather stark contrast. So six out of 10 Americans actually believe that there are too few women in politics. And meanwhile, Nordic countries rank within the first 10 places in the Global Gender Gap Report, and the United States ranks 49th. And that's out of 144 countries. So it is a lot of countries, but if we like to claim that we're number one in a lot of things, and all five of the Nordic countries rank in the top 10, like we're doing something wrong. So, <laughs> you know, OK. And then, yeah. So these are actually really interesting surveys done by the Pew Research Center. So I just wanted to show them to you guys really quick. So this first one on the left is, uh, shows characteristics that people think would help men rather, or men or women, or vice versa. So uh, on the left, it's elected high political office. And the right is top executive business positions. I want to focus on the left. So the top. So being uh, assertive, decisive, and ambitious, most people have decided help men more than women. And those are characteristically stereotypical male or masculine stereotypes, whereas on the bottom, uh, being compassionate, approachable, and physically attractive have been deemed more helpful for women in high political office, which are deemed more feminine um, characteristics. And then the one on the right I thought was extremely interesting that in America, among the Republican Party, there's, very, there's a very wide gender gap in view, on the views on women in uh, political leadership. So there are too few women in uh, high political offices in the country today. The Republican men, among the Republican men, 24% agreed, whereas 44 of the Republican women agreed. Um, and this bottom one, the third one on the bottom, is really interesting. Uh, women having to do more to prove themselves than men is a major reason why there aren't more women in high political offices. And 28% of Republican men agreed, whereas 64% of Republican women agreed. So there's discrepancy within that party um, how well women are doing in politics. Okay, and then in this one, I just really want to focus on the top one that was kind of mentioned previously, that 61% um, of the people polled here uh, believe that women have to do more to prove themselves than men in high political offices. So it's just some food for thought. Um, so this is my statement on intersectionality, just to, you know, what are we if we're not intersectional? Uh, so I just want to point out that uh, rape culture is far-reaching and pervasive. And it's dangerously oppressive use against women to degrade them physically, socially, and politically. But women of color often face the brunt of it. Racism and racial biases result in greater violence against women of color, including, if not especially, sexual violence. Um, the LGBTQ plus community also face a high percentage of sexual uh, high, per, a high percentage of sexual violence at the hands of rape culture. So both of these communities experience higher rates of poverty, stigma. Uh, and marginal, marginalization, which inherently place them at greater risk for sexual assault. Um, and then the bottom is rather important as well, that rape culture also affects men as it contributes to the preservation and sustaining of toxic masculinity, which makes men more violent and isolated because of their lack of emotional intelligence. So the big concept here is that rape culture is more rampant in, rampant in the United States than Nordic countries due to less comprehensive sex education, the subjectiveness sexual assault cases are given, and the lack of women in leadership positions. So how can you help make the shift? So first of all, back to that uh, rape culture pyramid, just don't let any part of it fly. If you see anything, hear anything that's contributing to that pyramid of, la of rape culture, say something. Um, you know, you would want someone to say something and stand up for you if it were happening to you. Um, lobby or petition. Uh, lawmakers for stricter sexual violence laws, or like in the case of Aaron Persky, recall the judges that miscarry, ju uh, miscarry justice. And um, a big part of it is voting for women. Thank you. Thank you so much. All of the women who are here today are here because the women before us fought for our right to education, fought for our rights, our civil rights, and now we are fighting to further the movement um, to make our society better. 
for that. We are very lucky to be here in this space. And other women around the world are still fighting the fights that we have long won and now take for granted. Next is Ava DiGeralmo. She is a liberal arts major who is transferring to UC Santa Cruz in the fall and has been published in this year's magazine from West Valley College, Voices. Today, she is presenting Witchcraft and Pentecostalism, Women's Struggle for Autonomy in Ghana. I'm Ava DiGeralmo, and today I'm presenting on witchcraft and Pentecostalism, a women's struggle for autonomy in Ghana. So my research question for this project was, how does Ghana's history with witchcraft and current Pentecostal beliefs inhibit women's agency in the country? In order to answer this question, we first have to talk about what is Pentecostalism. Pentecostalism first emerged in the early 1900s. It was born out of Protestant Christianity beliefs. It's considered evangelical and sometimes even extreme. It is defined and characterized by three elements, emotionalism, speaking in tongues, and the belief in divine healing. Um, so I have a video clip that's gonna help contextualize the effects of Pentecostalism in Ghana in today's society. Martin Fletcher reports from Ghana on the continent of Africa, one of the places where people are switching from traditional churches to a new one. They call it spiritual warfare. God is fighting the devil and the body is the battlefield. Jesus. It's Jericho hour in the Christian Action Church in Ghana, West Africa. One day you wake up! They're Pentecostalists, the fastest growing religion in Africa. The Spirit of God has come upon the person and the demonic spirit has no choice but to leave. It's a very exciting moment because after that you feel very free, you feel very light. Once cleansed, the church offers more to the believer, specific prayers to get a job, to improve your business, get married. It even works as a bank and gives loans. Looks after the kids. It's this hands-on approach that makes such inroads into other churches. Before Sunday prayers, Bible class for new members. Francis was a Catholic. Today he's becoming a Pentecostalist. One big reason, a promise of business success. As I'm here today, by God's grace, it will even increase my level of creation. That is what I believe. As a graphic designer? Yes. Downtown, every second person you ask is either a Pentecostalist or thinking about it. Despite the donations, which, like some other churches, are high. You give 10% of your income from this shop to the church? Yeah. Christianity is not a religion, it's a, it's a way of life. And such an attractive one that other African churches are hemorrhaging members. If you can beat them, you join them. So we sing and sing and sing and dance and dance and especially the youths. Trying, to, trying to stop your members from going to the Pentecostal, Pentecostal church. Pentecostal churches. Because if you don't, they will, they, will, they, will, they will steal our members, steal in court. In the name of Jesus. It's a bit late. Dr. McKinley says 70% of his Methodist congregation has left to join the Pentecostalists. Like Francis, the graphic designer we met at Bible class. I'm hoping that everything about my life too will change for better. Africans wanting salvation now. Martin Fletcher, NBC News, Accra, Ghana. Sorry about the technical difficulties. So as you can see from the video, the citizens of Ghana do not get a whole lot of support from their government. So they have to turn to the church for their support. Um, so this leads us to witchcraft in Ghana. Ghana has a long history of witchcraft. And unlike our Western preconceptions of witchcraft, um, it's very different. So we tend to think about pointy hats and broomsticks and black hats. But in Ghana, anyone can be a witch. They believe that witchcraft is something that you can put on and take off. A witch would take off their witchcraft before they go to church and put it back on before they put a hex on someone. They also believe that hexes are carried through food and drink which is why the accused are often close family members and friends of the people accusing them. To quote Seth Twinebua's uh, scholarly article, Pentecostalism, Witch Demonic Accusations and Symbolic Violence in Ghana, 
The common theme running through these writings is that the discourse of witchcraft became intensified, particularly in periods when the pursuit of individual economic interest became prominent in the traditional society. In other words, the advent of colonialism and capitalism leads to the rise of witchcraft accusations. This is because people use accusations for their own personal gain. <clears throat> so the intersection of Pentecostalism and witchcraft in Ghana. There was a case of a woman accused of witchcraft. She was brought up in front of her entire congregation and told to confess her sins. She told the pastor that she was no witch, but a witch for Jesus. The pastor responded to this by slapping her across the face. And the congregation responded to that by cheering. <laughs> this is very disturbing. To again quote Seth Twinibua's scholarly article, one reason for this lack of deliverance guidelines in these churches is the unstructured nature of this strand of Pentecostalism Neo-prophetic Pentecostal churches usually operate under no particular religious body or hierarchy. As such, an individual pastor's temperament and or theological understanding of the mode of deliverance influences how much coercion or violence is needed to cast out a resistant demon. In other words, when it comes to pastor prophets and accused witch witches and exorcisms, the pastors are, are judge, jury, and executioner. They determine how long the exorcism lasts and how brutal it becomes. There was another case of a woman accused of witchcraft. She did not show up to church to confess her sins or to the exorcism. She was hunted down and burned alive. She was a 65-year-old grandmother. These atrocities do not only affect women. They also affect the poor and otherly abled and the mentally ill. Because Pentecostalism idealizes the man of God mentality, it inherently excludes women, poor, and the disabled. <clears throat> women are not given education past primary school, so they have no source of economic income and often can't escape their situations. Sometimes they're not even aware that they're being marginalized. When it comes to the poor, the otherly abled, and the mentally ill, they have always been ostracized in Ghana because they are perceived as being more susceptible to witchcraft due to the fact that their survival depends on gifts of food and drink from other people. This complete ostracization of the mentally ill leads to a void in mental health care in Ghana. In 2011, there were an estimated 2.8 million people with mental health disabilities in Ghana, 650,000 of which have severe cases. For those 650,000 severe cases, there were only 600 psychiatric nurses, 12 practicing psychiatrists, three mental health facilities, and less than 1% of the national budget was spent on mental health care. Because the Pentecostal church believes in divine healing, they challenge modern medicine. Their way of dealing with the mentally ill is to put them in prayer camps. In prayer camps, the mentally ill people are chained up to trees, given no food or water, and left there until the demons are thought to be exercised from their body. Pentecostal divine healing does not only affect the mentally ill, but those affected with HIV. Taking statistics from Kea Tanasi's article, Pentecostal Theologies of Healing, the region is home to 69% of people who are HIV positive, 71% of new infections, and 70% of AIDS-related deaths. The lack of education and the support of divine healing from the Pentecostal church is doing nothing to help this atrocity. These are pictures from prayer camps. The man on the left has been chained to that tree for nine years, surviving only on the food and water that passerbys give him out of pity. A related quote from Lucretia Mont's essay, not Christianity, but priestcraft. How many women are there now immolated upon the shrine of superstition and priestcraft in our very midst, in the assumption that man only has a right to the pulpit, and that if a woman enters it, she disobeys God, making her believe in the misdirection of her own vocation, and that it is of divine authority that she should be thus bound. In the Pentecostal church and in these prayer camps, the mentally ill and women are literally bound and immolated. So what's being done to stop all these atrocities? 
Well, there's been attempts to bring biomedical care into the prayer camps, although there are conflicts with that because it directly conflicts with the idea of divine healing. ActionAid Ghana is a program which seeks to reintegrate the accused women back into society, and CAMFED seeks to educate girls and women across the country. Thank you. Within the last century, there has been a movement of revisionist history. And if you happen to take women and gender studies to women in the arts, you might have heard about this. One of the biggest things that I took away from that class was learning that throughout history, many works of art that were created by women were passed down as unknown and then thought to be made by a man. So there was this huge erasure of women in history and women in art. Now, it's eye-opening and exciting to learn this information and all these contributions made by women. Um, so next, we have Raquel Guadalupe. Now, she is pursuing a major in costuming, which is her own form of art. And she has been published in Voices twice now. Now, today, she will be presenting Lee Krasner, an abstract story. Okay, um, I am doing my presentation on Lee Krasner, who is an abstract artist, hence an abstract story. Um, I highly suggest you guys take a painting class here at West Valley. All the teachers here are wonderful. And um, I highly suggest you take the Woman of the Arts class. It is really eye-opening. Um, so Lee Krasner, uh, she was born on October 27th, 1908. Um, her real name is Lenore, but she goes by Lee by her fellow artist friends. Um, at 19, she attended the Cooper Union for the Advancement of Sciences and Art. Um, Lee is the sixth child out of seven, and um, her older sister Rose unfortunately passed away, and Krasner was said to have to marry Rose's husband to raise um, Rose's um, kids. But Lee Krasner de denied the offer, and unfortunately that meant her younger sister Ruth had to marry and was forced to raise her Sister Rose's kids, um, but that was just something that had to be done at the time. Um, so Lee Krasner, um, as I said before, she went to the Cooper Union for Advancement at age 19, and after she went to the National Academy of Design in the Upper Manhap Manhattan West, West Side. Um, so a, a bit of cool information about uh, Peter Cooper. Um, he is a philanthropist and um, a, a tremendously big and um, engineer known for the tomb thumb, which is the first locomotive ever invented. Um, his school was definitely free for the working class. Um, he was one of the few that opened his schools for women and men. Um, the, in the foundation building, which was this little building right here, and it's still up there to this day, um, is actually a building where Abraham Lincoln was invited to speak and campaign there. And uh, Peter Cooper is actually a very close friend to Lincoln at the time because he was highly against slavery and also defended Native American rights. Uh, the National Academy of Design was created in 1825 by a couple of young male artists. Um, they founded the school to emphasize the study of fundamental drawings, painting, sculpture, engraving, and architecture. Um, they have changed the names three times, and there's also two different types of um, names that you go once you attend the academy. You could either have an associate, an A and A, or you could be an academician, which is an NA. And these are highly, highly chosen based off your recognition and your excellence within the school and out of school. Um, applying to the academy, Krasner had to submit a self-portrait. And as you can see here, um, it's kind of an unusual one. She's not really using very realistic colors. It's more kind of like an abstract and um, really hewed up color scheme. Um, so it was, highly, it was seen as highly unusual because she was also doing this outside and looking at herself from a, mirror, from a mirror. And this proved her skills to be very advanced and it was able to get her into the school of the academy for arts. And now getting into the school means um, you either have to be invited into it or you can be um, asked to attend there for a, like, either a month or a semester. Um, one, one of my favorite quotes that from Bridget Quinn, which is a book that we read in the Woman of the Arts class, is she doesn't flatter herself physically. Her lips, nose, and ears are big, her eyes small, but in one way she does flatter. She wholly and self-consciously presents herself as a painter. 
Um, Krasner decided to leave the academy in 1932. Um, she left with one of her boyfriends, um, Igor, and she left due to kind of the uh, teacher's kind of backlash towards her art. So because Lee Krasner was known to do cubism in terms of her classes, um, the teachers didn't really like her abstract approach to art, so they told her to take a mental bath, which is why she stopped attending the academy. And together, the two of them um, kind of spent their time um, at a jumble shop, which I will show you in the next slide, but they also continued to, perf to perfect their craft, and Lee Krasner started building up her name once she left the academy. Um, this is uh, the jumble shop. It's kind of a, it's a restaurant and slash coffee shop. Um, and you didn't get a seat at the table unless you thought Picasso was a god. So it's kind of like an artist hub, kind of like our Starbucks, but for artists. <laughs> um, Post-impressionism, as you guys may see, the starry night. Um, Vincent van Gogh is one of the biggest post-impressionist artists, and um, it is commonly known um, to be a way of art that you can just really kind of express how you're feeling in a painting. Um, 20th century artists start exploring this more into their craft. And um, like I said before, you try to express things differently, and a lot of artists started incorporating it more in their drawings after the 20th century. Um, so in 1941 to 1942, um, Krasner was invited to attend an art show and showcase her art. And um, it would feature many big artists like Matisse, Bar Baraque, and Picasso. Um, this is where she met Jackson Pollock, who was in a group of ab abstract expressionist group. And it's called um, ABEX as like the short term, because when you say that five times fast, you will say it wrong. Um, his paintings were gestural, um, mostly big splashes of paint all over a humongous canvas. Um, and it's usually done um, more recognition to males than females. Um, so they did tend to use each other for ideas to build off of each other, um, but more so, I. I'd like to put it as Lee Krasner kind of discovered Pollock because she was already so highly recognized that when she introduced a man into her life, he kind of got all this attention and got more of the attention than she did because himself being a male and an abstract artist, he was proclaimed the god of abstract art. Um, they were married in 1945, and when they moved into a house, um, she worked in a small room, and Pollock had a large studio barn to work in. Um, Pollock has a very distinct style of paintings. As you can see, um, if you guys go to San Francisco and you guys go to the kind of the art street, you will see a lot of his work within the art streets and within the buildings in art street. Um, they are mostly just splatters of paint and like I said, they're highly, highly uh, massive pieces of art. Um, we are gonna skip that part. <laughs> um, Lee Krasner made her art smaller because the room she was working with was limited in space and um, she this is where she perfected her little paintings as you could see on the far right corner on the bottom. Um, she tended to focus more on the way the brush strokes hit the canvas rather than just how they would fall onto the canvas. Um. Lee Krasner is one of many artists who unfortunately have no recognition. Um, this is just a few. We have Elaine Kooning. Um, Elaine Kooning was born in 1918 from Brooklyn, New York. We have Michael West from 1908, born in Chicago. We have Joanne Mitchell from 1905, um, Boston, Massachusetts. We have Pearl Fine from 1925, born in Chicago, Illinois, and um, Alma Thomas from 19. 1891 in Colombia, and Sonia Getchtoff from 1926 Philadelphia, and she is now kind of located in San Francisco, and you can see more of her work kind of actually next to Jason um, Jackson Pollock's work in San Francisco's Art Street. Um, so these two paintings are kind of done are done by Lee Krasner. Um, one of her one of my favorite quotes that she has um, is. I think my painting is autobiographical if anyone could take the time to read it. So as you can see, kind of after Jason Pollock died um, in 1956, she kind of started creating larger pieces of work. Um, the motivation I would suggest is kind of because, unfortunately, a lot of people 
still claim her to be just Pollock's wife, but in a recent um, video that I saw her interviewing in, um, it says that she will always be J uh, Jackson Pollock's wife, but she was an artist before Pollock, after Pollock, and during Pollock. Um, so um, if you can see the little paintings, those were when she was married to him and she was forced to work in a small attained room. And then after, kind of just the world around her, kind of a lot of people started recognizing her more, sadly because of her husband's death. Um, but it felt like, I feel like I shouldn't have taken her husband's death to even recognize such a talented artist such as Lee Krasner. Um, the last thing I want to leave you guys with is that there's so many young artists like these who aren't getting the recognition they deserve. And it shouldn't depend, it shouldn't be um, a man who decides whether or not she is worthy to be a painter or an abstract artist. There are so many young artists out there who have a lot of potential and it's our job as people and as uh, humans to really let all their voices be heard through their art or through their voices. And it's not just an art, it's an everything that they may practice to do. Thank you. Now, one of the reasons it's so important to stay informed and to stay vigilantly informed is to help out others as well. And we call out the injustices that we see others facing. Now, recently, um, a mega church in California called Bethel Redding started a movement called Changed. And that movement started using the hashtag once gay. So even in this state where conversion therapy is illegal, we still see evidence of people trying to erase and harm LGBTQ plus community. So even in 2019, our fight is far from over. Our last presenter today is Hannah Quantz. She is an English major here at West Valley, and today she is presenting diversity versus a nationalistic ideal. How cultural backlash impedes LGBTQ plus civil rights in contemporary Romania. Hey, girls and gays and everyone else. Um, <laughs> all right. Um, my presentation today is called Diversity versus a Nationalistic Ideal, How Cultural Backlash Impedes LGBTQ Civil Rights in Contemporary Romania. Um, I chose this topic because um, I'm originally, or my family is originally from Romania, and so it was, it's a bit close to my heart. Um, but I, did, I found a few things during my research that I did not expect, so let me take you on this journey with me. Um, let's see. Is the clicker working? Yes, it is. OK. I started off uh, my research um, by asking myself these questions. Um, what's the current legal status of same-sex marriages, civil unions, discrimination protections, and consenting same-sex behavior in Romania? What are the historically and culturally based attitudes that have influenced these policies? How do some of these attitudes overlap between other nearby countries? And what factors are shared that contribute to the similarities? Um, and finally. How do attitudes about um, LGBTQ citizens interact with Romania's history of homophobia and misogyny? All right, uh, let's get into it. So for some background, um, Romania is in Eastern Europe, which was part of the uh, communist bloc uh, directly after World War II. Um, and after the Berlin Wall fell in 1989, formerly communist countries began to uh, hold free elections, just peacefully transition into a democratic state. Um, however, Romania was the only one that required a violent revolution to get the job done. Um, Nicolae Ceausescu refused the democratic reforms and was executed in 1990. Um, and you can see that Romania is right there, right above Bulgaria. Um, so these are the current laws and protections for LGBTQ citizens in Romania, as far as I could tell. This is current. Um, as you can see, um, homosexual behavior is legal. Um, but the laws about changing gender are ambiguous and same-sex marriage adoption um, are not recognized, which can make it hard for residency. Um, and also conversion therapy is not banned. That's gonna come up later, so there we go. Um, okay, most recently in Romanian LGBTQ news um, was the 2018 marriage referendum. Um, since 2015, a coalition of religious and pro-life groups dubbed the Coalition for Family, which is like kind of a non-creative name, right? I mean, <laughs> like uh, pretty much every, you know, LGBTQ hate group is called something like that. I mean, you know, <laughs> those are ours. <laughs> um, they've been spearheading a campaign to change the Romanian constitution, which um, currently uses a gender neutral language when we're referencing marriage uh, between spouses rather than between man and wife. 
And so these groups were attempting to change the Constitution to make it specifically man and wife. Um, the referendum did not pass due to low voter turnout, but the amount of support it got was a little bit concerning. Um, so yay, but not at the same time. Uh, all right. Um, I had, in my research, come across two main factors um, as to why Romania is like this. It's so far behind other, any other European country. Um, it's one of six that don't recognize same-sex marriage in Europe. Um, and there are two reasons for this. Um, I'm going to boil it down to orthodoxy and nationalism. So orthodoxy is the official religion in Romania. Um, and it is one of the big reasons that um, LGBTQ uh, civil rights are so far behind. Um, let's start with communism. Uh, homosexuality under communism was erroneously linked to pedophilia and rape, and the church has kind of carried this attitude forward in a different way. Um, the Orthodox Church propagates homophobic beliefs, usually through fear of the destruction of family values. Haven't we all heard that before? Mm -hmm. um, it's, and the reason that it's so effective in doing this is because it is a credible moral authority in Romania. Um, so to illustrate this, negative attitudes about homosexuality um, have prevailed in Romania, but have dropped in Bulgaria in recent years, despite the majority of the population in both countries is orthodox. Um, however, the main difference is the Bulgarian church is fraught with scandal, so no one respects the opinion of the church. <laughs> Whereas in Romania, it's just the opposite. Um, all right, and the second point is nationalism. Big theme, big, big very current. Um, <laughs> yes. Um, in Romania, national pride was stifled under communism. Um, being, seeing yourself as Romanian was seen as anti-establishment when the communists were in control. Um, and then as a backlash to that, hearkening back to my title, uh, Romania um, is now attempting to establish itself in, in a national identity and um, like, as opposed to we are communists, now we are Romanian and proud of it. Um, and orthodoxy is inherently linked to Romanian national identity, um, and so is heterosexuality. So it goes, the link goes, um, anti-communism is nationalism. Nationalism is associated with heterosexual idealism, and therefore LGBTQ identity is seen as anti-Romanian. Um, however, activists currently are finding ways to link this nationalistic pride and Romania's maybe hidden history of potentially homoerotic figures. Um, like if you ever, if you've ever heard the origin myth of Romania, uh, it was very Roman. R you know how Roman myths are, um, <laughs> and so, and so that's one way that um, LGBTQ people are trying to stake a claim in their own Romanian identity. Um, so I had mentioned that. Um, I had mentioned that in other parts of Europe, um, things were a little more advanced and uh, attitudes are a bit more similar um, in Romania in terms of the church. Uh, let me illustrate this by comparing Poland and Slovenia. Um, so these two countries have big differences in their policies towards LGBTQ people and big differences in the perceptions of the church. Um, Poland is notably more homophobic um, than Slovenia. Um, the church is respected, and it was seen as a, um, a protector of the people from the communists when they were um, occupying the country. Um, disagreeing with the Catholic church is seen as an act of national disloyalty, similar to Romanian identity being linked with orthodoxy. Uh, however, in Slovenia, um, it's far less homophobic, and the Catholic church in particular never became a common point of national identity. Uh, fundamental, fundamentalism never took root. Um, the church is viewed as an institution that corroborated at worst with the communists. Um, and it was never linked to national identity. Imagine that. Um, Slovenia is a much smaller country also and has a lot more um, experience in diversity of its population. So, um, Of course, this is intersectional. This is a feminist conference. It's, of course, it's intersectional. Um, and um, LGBTQ attitudes have... Um, do intersect with racism and misogyny. Um, as, as is probably pretty um, a fair assumption, traditional gender roles are culturally condoned in Romania and associated with national identity and order. So feminism and queer movements are often um, stifled because of this. And racism in Romania is also pretty rampant. Um, 
The Romani people, um, who are migrant groups uh, who move throughout Europe and are, are a racial, racial ethnic group, uh, have been persecuted in Romania for centuries. These communities tend to also be conservative within themselves. So LGBTQ Roma tend to experience double discrimination from both their um, ethnic community and um, the larger country. I'm going to talk a little bit about the Roma. Um, these people have been marginalized, enslaved, and killed, and stereotyped throughout Europe. Um, they're a migratory group, and um, in America, this, uh, this word is not a slur, but I'm not going to say it because um, I've recently learned in my research that it is. Um, they are called the G slur because they are migratory. Um, there's genetic and linguistic evidence that they originated in northern India and then gradually migrated up into Europe. Um, they were enslaved throughout the 19th century. They were um, the target of Nazi atrocities. Um, the brown triangle is the, um, is the marker for the Romani in the concentration camps. Uh, and about two million of them died during World War II. Um, as recently as the 1980s, Romani women underwent forced sterilization to control their population, and they are, to this day, disproportionately poor. Um, I'd like to read from this essay about being Romani and a lesbian um, and the intersectional tension that that creates. What Romani lesbians have in common are overlapping feelings of being different from the majority, either ethnically or sexually, and feeling of not belonging within their own communities. The latter identity, which is being a lesbian, prevents us from feeling complete belonging with those whom we share our first identity, Roma, as well as known social constructs that a Romani woman cannot be a lesbian. Um, if a woman is a lesbian, she's not a good Romani woman. Um, Romani lesbians create tension within the social order by not conforming to racist and sexist stereotypes of Romani women uh, as a pregnant woman with many children around her skirt or with an abusive husband, a prime example of unequal gender power relations, or Romani women as highly sexualized objects like Esmeralda from The Hunchback of Notre Dame or Carmen from the opera, uh, whose talents are enticing men as prostitutes or exotic entertainers, which are images that many of from the majority non-Roma population are accustomed to. Um, fortunately, there is work being done. Um, in 2017, in June, a conference was held to examine the intersectional struggles of Roma people and LGBTQ people in Strasbourg, France. Topics discussed included discrimination, inclusive policy making, awareness, and other helpful workshops for those who are at the crossroads of discrimination. Um, and as you can tell from my sarcasm throughout this entire lecture, um, conversion therapy is back in America in a big way, and I wanted, to, I wanted to mention that these attitudes of idealized heterosexism and um, heterosexuality being idealized in the American church and in society as part of national identity do exist here. Um, currently, repackaged conversion therapy has become trendy lately in churches um, in the form of counseling or healing from unwanted same-sex attraction or gender confusion. Um, a couple of months ago, I don't know if you all have heard of Bethel, the really big producer of Christian worship music. Um, it's also a mega church and it, it's in Redding, California, just a bit north of here. Um, they rolled out a campaign called Changed two months ago using the hashtag once gay to promote accounts of people who have supposedly been like rescued or transformed from being LGBTQ. Um, there's been a lot of backlash against that. Um, that photo is from a protest uh, that UCLA's PRISM group did um, at one of Bethel's concerts to raise awareness for the kind of effects that conversion therapy has on youth particularly. Um, According to the Human Rights Campaign, um, research on the issue of family acceptance of LGBTQ youth conducted at San Francisco State University found that compared with LGBTQ young people who were not rejected, only, or were only a little bit rejected by parents or caregivers, um, highly rejected people were um, more than eight times as likely than their peers to have attempted suicide, nearly six times as likely to report high levels of depression uh, more than three times more likely to use illegal drugs, and more than three times as likely to be at high risk for STDs. Um, and I wanted to close out with a, um, a statement about why this is important, why you should speak up about it when you see it, um, from a member of PRISM at UCLA, um, Johnny Schmidt. It's important to speak up because so many people view organizations like Bethel, especially because they produce worship music that is good and constructive and beneficial for many, as infallible. I don't deny they have produced content that's helpful for many people, but it hurts me that so many Christians feel like this outweighs the immense damage Bethel does to LGBTQ people. I was disappointed that most people didn't react to our protests, they probably dismissed us as crazy, and that even people who did react didn't seem to care. 
I definitely think it's only po it's possible. I definitely don't think it's possible to only support organizations that have perfect records of treating LGBTQ people well, but um, Bethel is directly involved in spreading incredibly destructive messages, and I want people to know about how harmful this is. Thank you so much. Okay, really quick, while we're collecting the rest of them, I have one right here that I really like. How did Betsy DeVos weaken the legal system, making punishment for rape, sexual assault more difficult to carry out? Can we get a little bit more information on that, please? Um, I mean... Um, so, title, it wasn't exactly the legal system, it was a... Um, what is it, like a, a measure? What would you call Title IX? What would you call it? It's like a measure. It's title yeah. yeah, like Title IX's a measure that um, is created to um, promote equity on college campuses, and within it, it helps um, defend victims of sexual assault. So um, it makes it more. She made it. She changed vital components of it that discourage victims from reporting their crimes in the first place. So. Um, Basically, uh, the, the biggest point was that she now allows cross, is she? She changed Title IX so that um, cross-examination is now allowed, whereas before Title IX um, complaints for sexual assault previously were done in small rooms. Um, the victim spoke to a counselor, reported their crime, but now it's done in front of a large group of people, and if the accused chooses to do so, they can, um, have that large group of people witness a cross-examination with the victim and the accused in the same room, um, which is just inherently dis disadvantageous to the victim because it's traumatic for them. So it just dis it makes it so that victims don't want to report the crime in the first place. Thank you. Now we have our next question is, can we ever, ever separate church from state truly? Why is this one so hard? <laughs> <laughs> um, currently, um, currently it's not separated, but I would say yes, it's possible. Um, we can never really separate our policy making from our moral beliefs and our moral compass, no matter what we believe or what religion we adhere to. But um, I think it's possible to be objective if you make an effort. And I think people can definitely make more of an effort in this country. Thank you. Our next question is, do you think offensive or hate speech should be illegal? I mean, that's kind of a complicated question because then we're dealing with freedom of speech. Yep. So I think that it would be very, very hard to make it illegal because everybody has a different definition of what they think hate speech is. So that, that is a really, really complicated question. And it's a, it's a complicated topic because it deals with a difference in people's morals, which is historically just, it's ruined so many things. So I think, I mean, obviously I don't agree with it, but I think it would be so hard to make it illegal because everybody has a different opinion and everybody could just say like, that's hate speech, that's illegal. Um, so there's a lot of questions on this one. <laughs> um, <okay>. All right. <laughs> now, um, in regard to the rape pyramid, um, you said speak up at any point of the pyramid, such as rape jokes. Should we report people who make rape jokes, report them to authorities? Oh. Mm. That's an interesting question. Um, I mean, a lot of, um, like, that's, that, that's included in the bottom tier of the rape pyramid. That doesn't mean it's, like, any less important because, as we know, it reinforces the ones above. So I guess in that instance, it would be circumstantial because I've definitely been in situations where I'm hanging out with a bunch of immature boys. And, um, <laughs> and they have made, like, a rape joke. And it's, like, and they're, like, people that have been, like, friends of my friends. And I have background knowledge of who they are and know that, that what they said was done in, like, to be funny. And I was like, hey, that's so not cool. Why would you say that? Like, and they were like, whoa. But 
if it's, you know, because no one expects to be called out. And then when you call them out, they're like, ooh. And then they don't do it again, hopefully, is the goal. So I guess it's kind of circumstantial that if, if it's, I guess it's hard to say, a certain type of rape joke that could be seen in more of an intent type of way rather than just a joke, I would definitely report. Okay. All right, thank you. Now, um, what made you choose your topic? <laughs> okay, um, so um, I chose um, my topic being Lee Craster uh, because I myself um, am an artist and I think there should be, when I go to museums, mostly all I see is just male artists. I see all their sculptures, I see all their paintings, and I never see too much of female artists in museums. Um, there's only one museum that I know of that's in New York that's literally dedicated to just women but there's so many male artists being exhibited in museums and everywhere and in every, th in every art form, I feel like just mostly male dominant. Like there's barely any male, um, I mean there's, any, there's barely any female directors in Hollywood. It's barely just starting to be just females, um, but even then there's still male dominant um, jobs that are um, just not letting females given, be given a chance to even pursue it or to think about because when you think about being a director, you you kind of think of a man because it's seen as a man can be the only one that could lead people, but a woman can do just the same. And it's kind of just like, I don't know, I feel like women should get more attention in the art world and artistic abilities than they should, than they are getting right now. So when I was putting together this presentation, I knew that I wanted to do something on the topic of witchcraft, and I kind of stumbled across the situation that's happening in Ghana right now. Um, when I found out all the terrible things that were happening there, I just knew that I had to cover it. Uh, I feel like it's a really important issue, and something needs to be done about it. Yeah. Well, I chose my topic because I like the controversy. I was reading a lot of articles when I was kind of trying to choose a topic, and just all the ones for Kara Walker, there were so many different opinions, and I just really wanted to explore that. And I also loved that she just created art to create art. Like, a lot of it wasn't like, oh, I want to send this mes message. She did send those messages, but it came from a place of, I'm going to create, here you go. I mean, as you can probably tell, my topic was intensely personal for me. My family's from Romania. Um, <laughs> yeah, and I am gay, and I am a Christian. So I thought it would be good to explore um, some of the so sociocultural attitudes that contribute to homophobic legislation and social attitudes um, and to raise awareness about the fact that conversion therapy is violence. Um, so. um, I chose my topic because it affects so many people. And I was really angry that it affects so many people, yet not a lot was done to end it in America. So I wanted to kind of explore how like we as like the bottom up could like do the job. Awesome, thank you so much. As we come to a close, I would like to leave the rest of you with one of my favorite quotes by Audre Lorde. And it's when I dare to be powerful, to use my strength in service of my vision, then it becomes less and less important and whether I'm afraid. Now, one more huge round of applause. Thank you all for coming today and witnessing this women's power in their education. Thank you so much.